The system likes to think that it's apolitical, that it's humanitarian, that it's our goodwill and we have good intentions and we want to do the right thing. Of course, many of us want to do the right thing and many of us do have good intentions, but we have to recognize the political system that aid is part of and we cannot separate it from that. You are listening to In Pursuit of Development with Dan Bannock. There has been in recent years considerable attention on the term localization. Indeed, many have highlighted the importance of local partners and their role in development and the need for equity and justice in the field of international development cooperation. The argument is quite straightforward. Local civil society organizations are the frontline workers, risking their lives to access areas that well-funded northern civil society organizations or even United Nations agencies cannot access. However, critics of the current system claim that the local civil society organization is often the subcontractor and not a real partner that is allowed to contribute to the design of various development projects. Moreover, if something goes wrong in the process, the local NGO may be blacklisted, not the UN agency or the northern NGO that received the funding. There are also other concerns. For example, the local NGO rarely receives a decent overhead rate or adequate funds to cover operational expenses. Local organizational staff are also often poached by the United Nations and other international agencies, including northern civil society organizations. So all of this, some claim, results in a serious and systematic erosion of capacity in the global south. And local knowledge and organizational capacity, some believe, is more often than not undervalued. My guest today is Degin Ali, who has for long spoken out against systematic racism, the systematic structure of power, money, and decision-making that goes into the design of the international humanitarian and aid architectures. For many years, Degen has campaigned for a more just and dignified aid system that allows recipient countries and local organizations to take back power. In a recent op-ed, she argued that talking about racism is just not enough and that we can't really afford another five decades of apathy in the international system. Degin Ali is the executive director of ADESO, an organization that has been a leader globally, but also in Somalia for its work on cash transfers and environmental justice. Degin has been a passionate advocate at the global level on the mainstreaming of cash as the primary response mechanism to humanitarian crises. I began by asking her to reflect on the current global governance architecture and why she has recently argued for a dismantling of this global architecture. Thank you, Dan, for having me. I think there's many things that don't work. I don't think it's just one. I can give you a a plethora of issues or reasons why it doesn't work. Let me start with the big picture and let's talk about the UN system that is currently our governance structure that we have. Um, And they are tasked with the Security Council, the UN General General Assembly um, is tasked with basically protecting people, resolving conflicts and uh, saving lives and uh, inter- ensuring you know, global security, and then addressing pressing issues like climate change, hunger, poverty, all of those things. So if you look at all of those issues that they're tasked with, 
we are seeing that there's a failure on so many levels. So let's go from the Rwanda genocide to Bosnia, which is celebrating um, the 10 year anniversary of uh, Srebrenica. No, not 10 years, but yeah, the anniversary of Srebrenica. And uh, if you look at those situations, you look at Syria, you look at the long standing conflict in, in DRC, you look at the, the illegal war in Iraq that was perpetrated against millions of people. You look at the pre-war situation of Iraq where sanctions were imposed illegally and devastated the entire economy and uh, led to the death of hundreds and thousands of people. You look at all of these situations and you, um, and what we have is really a very ineffectual at minimum uh, global governance system, at maximum a complicit one where the power brokers, the countries that have veto power, are basically deciding which issue, which conflict, which country, which situation deserves attention and which one doesn't if it doesn't serve their, their, their policy or their foreign policy or their strategic objectives globally. And people on the ground at the community level are left to basically um, suffer or die at the whims and the hands of these veto-wielding countries. So I would say, I mean, Israel is, I think, has the record of violating more UN resolutions than any other country in the history of the UN. But we don't see any um, sanctions against Israel. We see sanctions against uh, Venezuela. We see sanctions against um, uh, Iran, we see sanctions uh, pre, pre-war pre against Iraq, we see sanctions against all these other countries, but we don't see sanctions against a country that repeatedly violates UN resolutions. So when you look at that architecture, you realize how unjust the system is and how really it's been built to perpetrate the interest of certain countries. And it's heavily um, and the structure is, is not by accident, it's by design as a result of uh, what happened after World War II, the interests uh, of, of these European countries in the U.S. Um, a lot of the countries were coming out of colonialism or um, there was at least you know, discussions around ending colonialism in some parts of the world. All of these, uh, so this is the historical background that had that has laid the foundation of many of these institutions. And I'm just really only talking about the UN, but that same principle can be applied to the World Bank and how it was formulated and who has the power. And same thing with IMF, World Trade Organizations and all or World Trade Organization, WTO, and all the others. So that's the global architecture and the governance and financial and monetary and trade architecture that many of the countries that are former colonies uh, or what we call global South countries are dealing with and trying to address uh, issues of poverty, um, economic development, the, the impact of climate change and all of these things. Now, if you take that now, go to the next level, how does this impact humanitarian response? Well, uh, and humanitarian action or development action and and, uh, development assistance. Well, obviously there is a correlation between that architecture that I described and the ability to resolve um, conflicts and and, uh, the root causes of some of these conflicts. We're asked um, as humanitarian actors, primarily the UN agencies and INGOs uh, fly in to save lives and and build livelihoods of communities in Palestine, communities in Syria, communities in Iraq. These communities just as importantly need political justice, just as importantly need economic justice, just as importantly need these issues to be resolved rather than throwing some little crumbs of food. Um, Where is the wh- where is the real addressing of of the real root causes of these crises that we're asked we come in as um vultures really the humanitarian system to we make money off of these crises and we 
in a way, I think, look forward to them. I, I, I'm sorry to be so harsh, but I really do think it's a money generating kind of mechanism that has been created. There's no incentive structure built in to downsize and leave a crisis. The incentive structure is there to be there as long as possible and earn billions and billions of dollars in appeals and uh, from the UN or OCHA and other INGOs. So, so that's how I think these, the architecture directly impacts. Um, I mean, we can go into other issues around the, the, the financial and monetary policies that the World Bank has imposed on a lot of these former colonies. We can talk about the various reports that Oxfam has put out, not just on Hungary and income inequalities that are uh, spreading. And uh, I think there was a recent economist who was saying that the measures the UN is using the World Bank measures for poverty alleviations, which is really quite incorrect. And um, and other metrics have to be used because it's not really uh, reflecting the real situation of in- income inequalities, not only in the global north, but also in the global south. We, 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 we can talk about tax, the north serving as tax havens for illegal tax havens for and and money havens for a lot of not just dictators, but people, corporations, and and unwealthy people in the global south who don't want to pay taxes. That's happening also in the global north. But uh, we 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 are also complicit because some of these all these banks that are being havened for these um, communities, this resource, this revenue, this really important revenue, are banks in the global north. Um, so on the one hand, you know, the diffids or the Swiss or whoever are saying, oh, you have to address um, these issues of poverty. But on the other hand, uh, multinational companies that are British or that are Swiss or banks are really being extractive um, and taking resources from these countries. There are just so many issues here. So let's just tackle some of these uh, one by one, because you uh, raise some of the uh, the most relevant debates actually that are going on at the moment. One set of issues, of course, has to do with with how we measure poverty, how we understand it, how do we react uh, in terms of how we respond. Uh, is it a crisis-induced response? We often tend, at least the international community, tends to focus on large invisible crises. Some would characterize these attempts as uh, ad hoc, uh, of a firefighting nature. Others have been pointing, like you, that a lot of the current efforts, of course, serve global or the, the, the interests of the global north. And yet we also hear many uh, positive stories, at least this is before COVID struck, the Asian success stories of, of poverty reduction. And I know that you've written about this too, that Asia offers some hope. You've cited Indonesia, etc. So so that's one set of issues. The second, of course, set of issues relates to what has been sometimes termed as UN bashing. And there have been numerous negative reports on infighting among UN agencies, etc. But on the other hand, others say, well, what, what is the counterfactual? Without the UN, what would the situation look like? Would it be better? So my question, if we could start with the second set of issues first, that is, Do you think the solution is to um, reform, strengthen the UN, that member states should actually be doing more? Or is it a question of just abandoning it and and trying to have something new? What are your thoughts on that? Personally, I don't think the UN machinery can change, to be honest with you. I think it's too um, broken to be fixed. However, if we are going to go down the path of trying to do reforms, they have to be serious reforms. They can't be these light, so-called, quote-unquote, reforms that are not real, genuine reforms. For instance, obviously, the first and major issue is around veto power being removed from the five countries that currently hold it um, and fully democratized, democratizing the decision-making process of the UN. That's number one. Number two. I would say that we need to remove the UN salary scale in countries. And the only country I've heard of that has successfully opposed the imposition 
of the of the UN salary scale in their country has been China. Because why is this really important? Well, it's important because the Chinese government knew that if they utilized the salary scale of the UN in their country, that they would lose all the brightest and the best civil servants that they have invested millions and millions and millions of dollars in educating. And that's what happens. Uh, the best and the brightest in our countries are taken by the UN system and the INGOs. And so at the same time, we keep saying we need to develop the capacity of the governments to deliver, and they're the duty bearers, and we're constantly bashing governments. But at the same time, the system is designed to actually decapacitate not only governments, but also national civil society. So, so I would say that there has to be massive reforms in terms of the salary scale and uh, the benefits packages and all of that. The other reason why that's important is because there's no real incentive to ever leave the UN and go somewhere else. Once you are part of the system and you're an expat and you're earning fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a month and you have your children's college education fully paid for at Harvard University or MIT, the and the UN will fully pay the bill for three, four children or whatever then you don't really have an incentive to leave on top of paying school fees uh, from primary to secondary. And forget about all the other benefits that go with the UN package and the house, housing and all of that. So there is really very little incentive to get fresh minds, fresh thinking. I, I actually always say the worst rises to the top. The people that should actually be let go and fired from the system and the cleaning that's required in the system. I've met many, many horrible people in the UN system over the years. Those people never get fired. They actually get promoted and they go to another country in a more senior position. So there's no real incentive system in place at the HR level to really clean up the UN. I would say those are probably two massive reforms that need to happen. Third, equalizing the head of the agencies. Why is it that it's always a British that the ERC, the Emergency uh, Response or Relief Coordinator of the UN? Why is it always an American that's head of WFP? Why is it always an American that's head of UNICEF? These agency positions need to be on a fair rotating basis given to countries of the global south as well, and not just uh, these quote unquote donor countries. So I would say I'm not very optimistic that the UN can be reformed, but I don't think it should be another light technocratic exercise, but real reform that address some of these problems that I've described. What do you think uh, of the fact that in recent years you've had some alternative global institutions emerging? So you have the BRICS institutions, you have China backing uh, development banks, you have others, you have these emerging countries uh, emerging as major global players. It's not just India and China, but many other Asian countries and even uh, in Latin America. So you have that kind of a system, and you also see that big powers like China, which did not necessarily work closely with the UN system, they are actually now embracing the UN system. They're talking about trust funds, they're actively um, funding certain UN agencies, etc. How do you see that playing out? Because even those who have this kind of an alternative mechanism are still embracing the existing institutions, including the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, etc. So so what what are your thoughts on that? I mean, um, you said earlier that this is not a realistic, there is no realistic alternative, uh, but it'll be more of the same. Or do you think things will change? I... Uh, yeah, well, China is uh, a veto-wielding country, so obviously it has a vested interest in uh, some of the status quo. Of course, it is doing alternative models, and uh, and it is uh, it has its leg in both parts of the system. So in one hand, it's trying to support and back alternative models, but on the other hand, it's also trying to exercise its uh, its uh, power within the existing structures. So I, I'm actually of the opinion that, that our liberation from this neocolonial structures, it lies in our national governments and regional 
our bodies actually doing the kind of hard work that's required to alleviate poverty, to address climate change, to address issues at the regional level, security issues. And I always use uh, ASEAN as a great example of that regional cooperation. I think it's really, really important that trade and financial and other policies are really built across the global south, south to south. And um, and so I'm very, I'm very excited by that possibility and what's happening. And I do think that, you know, it's 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 a, a monopoly. So if you don't like that business, you don't like that provider, you need to have alternatives. And right now we don't have too many alternatives. And I think that's one of the motives or the reasons that will push change. So when you have an alternative model to the US, US dollar as the as the monetary, um, as the thing that holds the, 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 the glue of the entire global economy, together instead of gold as it used to be in the past, you know, and other countries are starting to talk about having alternative monetary mechanisms in place. Of course, the U.S. gets angry and some of these reactions are military in nature or sanctions in nature, but that has to happen. You have to give governments and people an alternative. And I think that's the way to go uh, to make the U.N. either really, uh, and the IMF and the World Bank really reform in a serious, genuine way that's less oppressive, or you basically have other options, other places to shop around and do your business as a government. So I think that's the way to go is to is to, to ensure that there isn't a monopoly of the governance systems. So let's move on to the role of national governments and national organizations. I've heard this in in some of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa that I've been researching on, but also in Asia uh, and other parts of the world, that uh, national governments often do not tend to prioritize the areas where they know that international organizations, international NGOs, uh, funders are working on they tend to, at least the national governments argue, that their domestic revenue generation is limited. They have to prioritize differently. So it becomes almost like a division of labor. The international organizations, international funders do the development work. The national governments do everything else. Civil society organizations, many of your colleagues, I suppose, are a part of the system where there has been a tendency, of course, to basically get funding from international organizations. Civil society is often not funded by uh, national governments. Do you think many of your colleagues in the civil society arena share your concerns? Or is it a matter of these colleagues of yours sharing it, but being afraid to voice their views for fear of losing funding? So I'll I'll talk about national governments in a minute. So if you can remind me to make that point about Rwanda. But I do think that's, I don't think enough share my views. I think more, you see, I think there's a, there's two worlds that's playing out in at the national level, maybe more than two, but certainly in the civil society space, we have the professionalized national uh, or regional professionalized NGOs um, that are part of this ecosystem that we've talked about. Either they get funding from the UN, they get funding from INGOs, and they are very heavily invested in the system. ADESO is one of them. We were one of them. I'm happy to say that we're becoming less, less that way um, and purposely downsizing. When I came into this business, and I will call it that on, on purpose because it is an industry, it is a business. I was very naive and I believed that like I was brainwashed by the UN and the INGO model and metrics of success being as an executive director that I had to raise money. And the more money I raised, the more successful Adesso was. 
And the more money we raised and the more offices we opened and the more programs we had, the more successful we were. And that's the model that we went down um, that road. It was not a very happy road. It was not a fulfilling road. It was a road that eventually led us, led me to even question our rootedness in the communities, how disconnected we were becoming from the communities, um, and the professionalization of our systems, how slow of a bureaucracy we were becoming because there were more and more layers of accountability, the more and more layers of every decision having to be made. When you're smaller, you're more, you're more rapid in your response and your decision making. It's much more. Uh, so I've seen the smallness. I saw the medium and I was seeing the large. And I realized, you know, why the, these machineries and I've worked at the UN and I've seen uh, how difficult it is to reform such a massive system. I've seen why they're bulky and clunky and really uh, not just the UN, but the INGOs as well, and really inefficient and can't make quick decisions and cannot innovate because the system that has been created is so debilitating. So, and that's the path we were going under, uh, going down. And that's, you know, we have just like the INGOs, just like the UN and agencies, we have been part, we are part and parcel of the system and have come to believe that. So much of my brothers and sisters in Somalia looked to Adesso as a role model. And they were like, we want to become like you. We want to become big like you. We want to get more funding like you. And that's a natural thing, obviously, because the funding gives you credibility. The funding gives you access to uh, different people and different rooms that you didn't have. It gives you also power that you currently don't have. And the humiliation that you constantly um, go uh, constantly experience as a local NGO is a little bit uh, dissipated, but it's the wrong metrics. The whole system is based on the wrong metrics. So we have those professionalized NGOs at the national or district level. And then at the same time, we have the real civil society, the informal groups, the CBOs, the human rights organizations, the climate actors and the climate activists, the, the guys um, organizing in Kenya uh, anti-police marches on the streets uh, because of police actions in Kibera and uh, Mathare slums in Nairobi. So to me, those are the real civil society. The people who are, as I said in my article, they're not armchair activists. They're real on the street activists. They're more they're more reflecting the Black Lives Matter movement, people who are risking their lives every day and risking their money, their resources, because they are actually speaking truth to power. They are risking being jailed. They are risking being defunded because they have a political position that someone doesn't like or being deregistered because the government doesn't like them. Those are serious things that they're willing to put on the table to be willing to put on the line, whereas us, I don't know what, how much we are willing to sacrifice as Global South uh, for the change to happen because we're so invested in our INGO partners and UN partners that many of us don't speak out the way I speak out. And I have been, I have experienced personal blacklisting. I have experienced personal Adesso being uh, shunned uh, because of the way I speak out. So I just it's really quite unfortunate. I would like us to become less of the first and more of the latter. And that is what I'm calling out for, uh, or what we are calling out for, Marie Rose and I in that article to say, we have to become more radical and more revolutionary in our thinking, in our analysis, and in, in our voice and our demands. And that, I, I think it's a challenge that we have as the Global South that we have to figure out how to address amongst ourselves. You mentioned that some national governments like Rwanda are uh, taking uh, a different approach. Is that the case? Is it just Rwanda? Are there other countries, other national governments that are saying enough is enough, we need a different approach? I, I refer to Rwanda more because I remember a few years ago, in terms of the used clothing trade, Rwanda, at least the president of Rwanda said that that this is something that, you know, the hand-me-downs, the second-hand clothes coming from the West, that's not something that my citizens want. We want dignity. We, des we deserve 
greater dignity, we should be producing things ourselves. So that was just one statement, one policy initiative that created a rift between the United States and Rwanda. But there aren't that many countries taking that kind of a, a radical approach, are there? To be honest with you, I know many people hate Kagame, but I think of him as another Nkrumah um, and these other freedom fighters, and um, but doing it in the modern era. And I totally, completely have utmost respect for him. And I'll tell you something. Kibera is the largest slum in Africa. And I always use this example. And it's right behind my house where I live right now. If I'm a woman, a single mother of three children living in Kibera, do I want to have freedom to protest, uh, freedom to say what I want, be able to insult a president, freedom to uh, expression and, 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 and all of these things that the West has been pushing down the throat of Africa and other countries, good governance, rights-based, all of these things. Okay, they're important, they're great. Or do I want to live under Kagemi's rule where I don't have maybe those freedoms, but I have running water, I have food on the table, I have safety for my children from being raped in Kibera, I have education for them, and they have a sense of pride, and they're able to walk down the street feeling safe and prideful that they're part of a country that values them, that hasn't left them behind. I feel like it's a zero-sum game that the West puts on us. It's either you have a corrupt system um, that we are in Kenya, massive corruption that is known by the Western donors. It's known by the World Bank. It's known by all of these, uh, the, the DFITs and the USAID, continue to support development action in a highly corrupt system that hasn't done anything for Kabira, that hasn't done anything for Madare uh, slums. And they're lauded as a great example of development. Nairobi is seen as the New York of Africa. Like we need to be compared to the West, of course. I mean, that also itself is neo-colonial. And uh, Kagame is constantly, um, you know, bashed and, and people talk about how he's a dictator this and a dictator that. But I feel that he probably needs to be a dictator to get the country to where it needs to go initially maybe at some point in the future when they are on strong economic and political uh, foundation, then maybe the country can become more liberal, liberal in, its, in, its, uh, in its rights that it gives to people. But I don't think it has to be a situation where someone like Kagame, who's prioritizing dignity, who's prioritizing economic justice over... Uh, over rights. Uh, he's not killing people. He's not committing genocide. He's not uh, taking people's land. He's not committing many things that supposedly governments that are more free, uh, that give freedom to their citizens are doing every single day. Um, so I, I question this notion of who is seen as the um, uh, as our role model and, and to, to run to in the global south or especially in Africa. The uh, Rwandan example is, of course, very interesting because uh, a lot of people say that, at least in my African friends, my colleagues in Africa, many of them cite Paul Kagame's leadership style as being visionary, transformational, unlike many other leaders who are accused of being more transactional. But others would still say that, well, this is visionary, etc., there's something about fostering a democratic political culture, not because of the intrinsic value of democracy, but more the instrumental value that without the freedom of expression and the right to mobilize, governments don't really get an idea of what people want, that you really need to make them away. It's the force of economic needs that are channelized through democratic participation, because otherwise things may 
work out well if you have a benevolent dictator, but you can't really guarantee that development will take place and you can't get rid of people either if they're not performing. Yeah, but if we look at Rwanda, is the government performing by by most of the metrics uh, that has been laid by the West? Yes, it is. It is performing. Um, does it have corruption? No, at least not in any significant way and certainly not in comparison to many other um, more democratic societies like Kenya um, and Uganda and other countries like that. Well, Uganda is a bit questionable, but yeah. So I don't really, I, I think the question um, or the framing that somehow I, I completely question this idea of democracy as the pathway to everything. I think everybody has a time and a place where where development happens and think changes happen. It's not something that can be externally driven. Every country will go towards its own natural path. And I think that if the people are getting their needs met, are the country is developing, there's no massive corruption. At some point in this journey, the people will say there will be more middle income people in the society of Rwanda. There will be more elites who will question the lack of democracy. That you know that will happen on its natural course. But we are we are never allowing these countries to take their natural course. We're always coming in and interfering. And, and trying to write it to look like what we think it should look like. And as long as there's no oppression taking place, as long as the needs of the population are being met, as long as development is happening, why are we disturbing the natural course of the people making the demand when they're ready, when they think it's time for Kagame's government to become more democratic? I think that's... Uh, that will happen in its natural course, but we just don't give it the time that it needs. We just are always so busy trying to push democracy down the throat of all of these countries as if it's the panacea or the, the, the remedy for everything. And it hasn't been, I'm sorry, and it should be questioned. What do you think about China then in, say, on the African continent? Because one of the major talking points or one of the major arguments that China proposes, advocates, is that they do not wish to interfere into local politics. They do not want to talk about conditionalities, or particularly those related to good governance and democracy or anti-corruption. It is just based on local interests of capital, of being provided for infrastructure projects, things that China possesses expertise on, and stuff that so-called recipient or partner countries need. So the Chinese model, of course, does not emphasize democracy and good governance. Is that working? Is that, is that the way to go forward? Or do you also see that China, the, the Chinese model has shortcomings? Yeah, I think it does have shortcomings. But the conditionalities of the West are not really in, in favor of the citizens. The conditionalities are very much based around the institutions that are democratic, but not whether the, the, the services are being delivered in a way that's democratic, whether the corruption is taking place in that country. Yes, you have a judiciary, um, you have parliament, you have elections, you have all the framework, the hollow framework for democracy but are citizens really feeling the, 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 the positive impact of those mechanisms? No, they're not. But do you still continue to support those governments? Yes, you do. So to me, that's massive hypocrisy right there um, and double standards. Why? Because, you know, Kenya is a strategic interest and we're getting what we need out of Kenya. We're getting what we need out of Uganda. We, you know, we're, we're getting the things that we need. It's not really altruistic, really based on is our, is our aid really in benefit of the, the population in those countries or our, our loans or our development assistance or whatever it may be. And I think it's not really viewed through that lens. It's more viewed through national interest. 
And similarly, the same applies for China. Uh, we can't fault for China for doing very similar things. I would actually say they're more alike than different because in some ways, China is saying, you know, we like the U.S. and Europe are not going to have that many conditionalities. But unlike the U.S. and Europe, we're not going to get too involved in the national politics of the country. If they want a road built, we're happy to build a road. If they want this done, a bridge built, we're happy to build the bridge, of course, with their own labor that benefits their private companies back home. Um, but that's the same thing as, uh, as, as the West. So I think they're just more obvious and apparent about their, 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 their aid and how they want to operate and work in Africa. I, I, uh, and in some ways, I, I think they're, what I'm more worried about is that we don't have responsible politicians on the receiving end who are taking these loans in a way that benefits the country rather than saying, you know, we're going to build X number of kilometers of roads in Kenya, but we don't have the ability to pay back those loans. I mean, the loans that the uh, Kenyan government has taken from China um, are completely debilitating the economy of Kenya. And uh, at the same time, you know, it's China is not that concerned and uh, nor is the U.S. all that concerned. But the U.S. and Europe have been in Kenya for how many years before China? Why didn't they build those roads for Kenya? Why didn't they build those bridges for Kenya all those years? Why put millions and millions and millions into, you know, democratizing institutions? Those roads would have had much more quicker economic impact uh, and economic development for the people than than these institutions, these lofty institutions that exist, but are extremely hollow. So I have concerns about China. I'm not saying China is um, is the, also the answer to the system, and they're providing a great um, another alternative model that's also that's um, that's really debunking everything in the West. I don't believe that, and I think like any superpower, it has its own uh, national interest that it's trying to protect, and that's how development assistance, loans, all of these things are always viewed what uh, is through the lens of national interest. For many years, uh, I've been arguing that uh, what China has been extremely good at is to project itself that it actually does have a, an interest in getting raw materials, in trading, that it also needs things that, say, certain African countries have. And if these countries don't have certain raw materials that China needs, it's something that could perhaps come about in the future if they discover oil or if they currently have tobacco. So the way in which China at least has presented itself has been appealing, in my view, to many leaders, particularly in Africa, because they make these leaders feel important that their countries are not just recipients, but actually can also provide certain goods and services. The West often has traditionally portrayed its activities as one of charity, that it does not really require anything in return. But that is changing now. So you see earlier this year, there was the UK-Africa summit. The Russians are, are organizing summits with Africa. It's not just China. Uh, Japan has, uh, has been on the African continent for a long time, particularly in relation to education, but also infrastructure. It's stepping up. Its activities, India is promoting frugal in innovation, you know, telemedicine and teleeducation. It can't compete with China in terms of infrastructure projects. So you have all of these things coming about now. And, and I was just recently talking to uh, the new director general of Norwegian, NORAD, about self-interest, national interest. And he said that... Uh, the, the future of aid will not just be about pure altruism anymore. It'll be one of enlightened self-interest. Well, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, are the Nordics different? Are there certain world actors that are somewhat different, that they tone down their national interest more than others? Yeah, <laughs> I think... Um... I, I actually, I, I respect China because they are much more, much more practical and brave in actually articulating their self-interest. Whereas 
um, the West and hasn't been, as you said, rightfully so. So I actually respect their approach because I think it's, you're putting all your cards on the table. And uh, we know for a fact that many of these development assistance packages is based on national interest of the US and Europe. But I don't think uh, the, the, the Nordic countries, uh, the Scandinavian countries are dramatically different. I think they're a smaller player. So as a result, they have different kinds of considerations to, to make in terms of how they exercise their national interest. But we all know, for example, in Somalia, that one of the biggest uh, actors that has been trying to position itself on the oil issue in Somalia and the extracting of oil are Nordic uh, is Norway and Nordic businesses and companies. So uh, I, I think to, to somehow portray them as um, more benevolent is uh, or more altruistic is, is I don't think it's, it's accurate. I think it's just because they're a smaller player, they have different kinds of ways of having to maneuver in these countries than um, the big players of the UK, the US and China. And you are right. I think there has been a gradual shift in Norway, in the Nordic countries, where in recent years, there's been much more of a movement away from pure solidarity to promoting business interests. And, and we see this in successive governments pushing for the interests of the private sector. Some of it, of course, is coming from the Norwegian taxpayer, local taxpayer saying, what's in it for us? You see many countries uh, in recession. I was just reading a piece where global aid flows, it says, has decreased uh, substantially of late. The UK is not providing as much as it was. So there are all of these things happening in the US too, with the election of Mr. Trump. You have this feeling that it is our country first and everybody else later on, and we can help others only if, we, if it also helps ourselves. So do you think that there is still an element of solidarity left in the international system, or has it just become one of promoting one's own national interest? Well, this is where I disagree. I don't believe there was elements of solidarity. I don't think, if there was, I think it was very minimal and it was overwhelmed by um, political and national interest of these countries as their number one priority since the end of colonialism. So I don't think, I haven't seen anyways, uh, solidarity in any significant way. So I think, you know, um, one of the things I said recently is that, you know, I don't understand what the big issue was with the merger between FCO and DFID in the UK. We've known forever that DFID's aid policies is, is directly linked to its foreign policy interest. Yes, now you have a new government. Uh, they've changed their, 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 their foreign policy interests. So therefore, they're going to tie, whether it's DFID or whether it's the new emerged, emerged agency, to that foreign policy interest. But it's not, it's not a surprise for me, and I don't know why it's a surprise for so many INGOs, UK-based uh, NGOs. Uh, and so I just, I, I just, what I would, what solidarity to me means is something completely different. It means that these INGOs that are licking the boots of DFID and USAID, risk their money, put their money on the table and speak the truth about this architecture that we've just talked about and the system that we talked about and really be true allies with Global South Civil Society and national governments and, and talk about uh, IMF and the World Bank and the UN Security Council and veto power issues and all of these things and put them on the table. But rather than trying to I think what the merger does is, you know, DFID being on its own, I think give them, gives them this illusion of a political nature of aid, which is very endemic in the system. The system likes to think that it's apolitical, that it's humanitarian, that it's our goodwill and we have good intentions and we want to do the right thing. Of course, many of us want to do the right thing and many of us do have good intentions. But we have to recognize the political system that aid is part of. 
and we cannot separate it from that. The, the majority of our conversation today so far has been about recognizing that political system and those political structures, but the NGOs and the UN agencies don't want to have that conversation. During the, the World Humanitarian Summit, it was much easier for localization, quote unquote, to become a priority than 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 the issue of Security Council. I remember there was a nun from Southern Africa, a country I can't remember which country it was in Southern Africa, who stood up in one of our Global South meetings. We would have these side meetings of just uh, local organizations and civil society, and she stood up and she said, "Listen." I don't want their money. Let them keep their 20%, 25% grand bargain commitment. Let them keep it. But what I want is for them to resolve two of the major crises of this world right now, humanitarian crisis. Tell them to resolve DRC and Syria and we'll be happy. You know? But they are but it the thing is when you go to those forums led by the UN with the donors at the table and you start putting out there the the political nature of the Syrian crisis or DRC and you start talking about UN Security Council reform and removal of veto power, it becomes it's a it's a it's a it's a bomb, and they don't want to deal with it. And they were constantly sanitizing the notes from the meeting to remove all those political issues from coming out. Constant sanitization. I can't tell you how many meetings I was at during the WHS consultation where I would go to the notes from the meeting or the summary meeting notes that would be produced by the secretariat. And I would be like, what? None of the stuff that we discussed is here. And uh, so this is this is what happens in all of these kinds of international forums. And it was less political and easier to put localization as a priority issue. They couldn't stop it anyways. It constantly kept coming up, but they certainly could stop the issues around the politics of aid. And they did try to sanitize that from the final report and the documents. So th this is, I think, what the DFID FCO merger represents is that they now have to confront the real political nature of, of, of their of the money that they're getting from DFID when they get a DFID grant. They have to now really seriously think about it, or they can continue to get the money as they've done uh, for God knows how many years, 50, 60 years, and uh, and still ignore that it's linked to foreign policy and um, have their heads in the sand. So yeah, they can, yeah, they can choose which path they want to take. A few years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting you in Oslo at a NORAD conference, and I was very moved by your passionate appeal for greater allocation of financial resources, funding mechanisms directly to local civil society organizations. You made the argument that localization, as you just talked about, and ownership and all of these buzzwords that have received considerable attention of late are not really operationalized when international NGOs or INGOs, northern NGOs, take most of the funding and most of the uh, bilateral agencies uh, often channelize their resources through multilateral agencies or through international NGOs. So you made the argument, and very persuasively, I must say, that local NGOs take all the risk, but the international organizations take all the credit. Is that still the case? Has Have things changed? Will it change after COVID now that travel is so restricted? Will you see greater allocation of resources, do you think, or do you hope there will be a change in the system with greater reliance on local organizations, or do you see more of the same? Yeah, um, I uh, nothing has changed, I'm sorry to say. If anything, I think the situation has actually gotten worse to some degree um, because of limited resources because of COVID. We're actually seeing more and more funding going to the UN and, um, and uh, less to even INGOs and even less to local actors. So I'm not very optimistic about, about this issue of funding and resources. And uh, I think that we we have tried in different ways to give alternative models to 
the donors to say, there are ways for you to channel this money to Global South. There are ways of you creating mechanisms, financial mechanisms that will meet your due diligence requirements that will allow more money to be placed in the hands of Global South actors and reduce your administrative burden from having to give out you know, 100 contracts in Somalia to local civil society when they want to give out five, 10 contracts because they don't have the administrative capacity. So, um, but I just, I don't know if, frankly, if the donors are ready to really shift power. And uh, I think the Scandinavians, I have to give them credit. I think Scandinavian donors are probably the most open to some of the calls and demands we've been making around shifting power. And I, I hope that, and, and the Dutch, I think the Scandinavians and the Dutch are probably the, more, the most progressive down this journey. There's still a long, long way to go, but this is not going to happen unless we build the infrastructure to channel basically the pipes. We need to build the pipes to move the money to the global south, and those pipes currently don't exist. Right now, the only pipe that really exists that most donors are really dumping money into is the OCHA country-based pooled funds, which are great. They have a, they serve a purpose, but they weren't designed for quote unquote localization or shifting power as its mandate. And there are many flaws within how these funds are managed. And they're still getting um, uh, INGOs and UN agencies in many countries are still receiving the lion's share of the money. But the donors are using it as an easy way to meet their grand bargain commitment by saying we've given more resources to the country-based pool funds. And they only exist in 18 countries or less, I think, in, in the world. So um, so they're not everywhere and they're not really the alternative that we're looking for. So we need to have more civil society led, locally rooted national funds that donors can meet the donor requirements, but also do a lot of local philanthropy, because we also believe that there's quite a lot of resources in the global south and that we can leverage a dollar from the U.S. or DFID or NORAD um, and turn it into two or three dollars through local philanthropy either from the private sector, the public, or diaspora. So this is these are the kinds of really different models of structures that we are advocating for to, to, to take place. And there's many other solutions and, and pipes that can be built to create that new ecosystem of devolving money. But I think money is just one part of the equation, and it's currently been the center of the localization debate has been around money. And money is extremely important, for sure. But we need to also frame it, the whole thing around uh, solidarity and movement building and less around money. And more also around us as Global South actors, you know, having our own reckoning and revolution in our national ecosystem, holding the donors accountable, holding the INGOs accountable, holding our governments accountable, holding ourselves accountable first and foremost, and recognizing that the metrics of success that we've been given is not really in the benefit of our people and it's not in the benefit of us as institutions and, and how we need to really reform ourselves as well. So I think that's where we should be heading towards rather than this continue these technocratic grand bargain conversations around the 25% and channeling money only. When I hear you speak and I read your work, Dagan, I wonder whether you believe that Northern NGOs have any role to play in development. Is there, is there an argument for why they continue to exist? Because the traditional argument is that, of course, the taxpayers here want greater accountability, their procedures, reporting, all of that. They feel more comfortable funding it through local or uh, national organizations in the global north that have partnerships with, with uh, organizations in the global south. But from, from your perspective, is there a value added in having these northern organizations? Are they doing something worthwhile or are they absolutely useless in your view? I think many are useless, but some are worthwhile. I think the business model that currently exists is not sustainable. If I was a CEO or the chair of one of these INGO boards, I would really question where we, if we will exist, if we will exist in 10, 15, 20 years. And I think 
this moment requires really some courage on the part of the INGOs to do a few things, to really reflect and question their existence, to really reflect their business model, to really reflect on on what the future looks like for them and how they can evolve to really be more about solidarity and less about money for themselves. I think there is a role, especially if the role is to act and um, to construct a more political engagement in this conversation around aid architecture and start talking about economic justice and political justice. We need them to have access to the power brokers on Downing Street or the White House or wherever. We need them to help us build uh, a movement so that it's not just us in the global south, but citizens from the north and, and, uh, and civil society from the north working with us to make some of these changes take place. So I believe they are needed, but they need to evolve to be relevant. And I think it means that some of them will go out of business, some of them will merge, and I think the ones who have the most courage to evolve and to recognize and see the writing on the wall are the ones who are going to continue to exist. What would you say is working in the field of international development at the moment? What works and why? And if you can also conclude with some thoughts on this global movement that you co-funded, consisting of Southern NGOs, called the Network for Empowered Aid Response, or NEAR, how, how is that doing? Is that getting a lot of traction these days? Yeah, I mean, NEAR, um, yeah, we, we, we helped to found NEAR, and we're hosting them and incubating them. They're not a legal entity of their own, but they aspire to be in the next few years. Um, they're still in the infancy stage, so they're, they're still crawling and not running yet because it was just founded in 2016 at the WHS. Yeah, I think NIR is also you know, grappling with uh, some of these issues and uh, trying to understand what their role should be as a, as a network of Global South actors and how to also radicalize the members and and become more of an activist movement-based um, organization or network. So I think that's, to me, would be the ideal vision for NIR to lead, to be a leader in that, in that new ecosystem. What is working well um, on the ground at the community level? To be honest with you, I don't have too many great examples. As a Somali who's been watching my people treated in the most undignified way, uh, seeing how the aid architecture has actually contributed to the war economy, corruption in the country. Sometimes I and my Somali friends, we talk and we say, you know what, it would be better if they all left, all the INGOs and the UN agencies, and they left us to deal with our own problems and our own issues, and maybe we would be better off. And we would be coming with some solutions quicker. But I, I have seen it as a crutch. I have seen it as debilitating. I have seen it create dependency. I have seen it destroy local farming communities. The, the food aid that used to be given now with cash as being the knee-jerk reaction. We pioneered cash and we're very proud of cash becoming more and more as part of the menu of options. But right right now, what we are seeing uh, with cash transfers is is that NGOs and UN agencies are extremely lazy and um, there's not very good targeting that's taking place. So you will have someone who's taking three, four different transfers from three different or four different organizations. And what incentive do they have to go back and farm in their communities if you're an IDP? They have no incentive. So... And, and this corruption and this war economy corruption that has been, that has proliferated because of the aid system and made people really turn many things that are culturally and religiously very wrong into something that's commonplace. You know, corruption has become so almost blasé. It's like you're crazy if you don't think corruption is okay in this culture. And that has been fueled by the aid industry. And so 
the UN being the number one actor in this in this in this thing in this process. So not local NGOs, UN and INGOs, because they get the bulk of the money and they are, you know, the, the, just the procurement systems and everything that goes along with the aid architecture has really fueled this, this, this level, massive level of corruption in the country. That's just shocking to me sometimes. And uh, having said all of that, if I could, if I could take a magic wand and remove all the aid actors, I actually would probably remove them all from Somalia. If, if I had that choice and that power. I really, I'm sorry to say that I don't have much positive examples to, to, to bring to you, but uh, all I've seen has made me more and more angry and more dejected and less optimistic. Jay and Ali, it was such a pleasure to see you online and to again have a, another chance to talk to you. Thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Thank you for having me, Dan. If you enjoyed this podcast, please spread the news among your friends and share it on social media. The Twitter handle for this podcast is Global Dev Pod. Thank you for listening to In Pursuit of Development with Professor Dan Bannock from the University of Oslo Center for Development and the Environment. Please email your questions, comments, and suggestions to inpursuitofdevelopment at gmail.com.